So this talk is aimed at small businesses and especially like greenfield kind of projects, because that's the type of work that we tend to get the most here uh, with SQL Data Partners. I think if you are looking at implementing Power BI at a large enterprise, the approach that you're going to take is going to be very different. Um, you know, you may um, consider something like a Power BI Center of Excellence. You may have resources for kind of regular trainings. Um, you may have to negotiate a lot more the balance between supporting self-service and something centralized. Um, so what this talk primarily is going to be about is more kind of a reflection of the type of work that we get, where someone's like, hey, we've decided to use Power BI and we need help with our first report or we want to kind of get things get things started. So just something to bear in mind. Um, so in terms of improving adoption, there's uh, four things that I want to kind of talk about at a, at a high level. So the, the first and most important thing is understanding your users, which should be true of any kind of reporting project. But one of the things that I've found is because of the flexibility of Power BI, there's a little bit more tension in what types of users you're trying to support and what types of reporting you're trying to support compared to something that's a little bit more rigid, like Crystal Reports or SQL Server Reporting Services, where that, that inflexibility or that rigidity makes the goal and the type of users you're trying to support a little bit clearer. So when you're building this out, one of the things you're going to have to think about is, okay, who is my first priority? And then how can I work to build out and support those other types of users? So we'll talk about that. The second thing, and really, really important, is to aim for consistency. And so that's going to be something that you need to think about in your training, in the way that you develop the reports, in the way that you encourage others to develop reports, how you message about where to find that content. Power BI has this problem where there's you know, a bunch of different ways that you can license it. There's probably at least a dozen different ways that you can embed and display reports. And it's, it's kind of a free-for-all when it comes to report design. Um, again, we're not in the world of paginated reports where we have kind of decades of templating and tradition for how maybe the layout should work, right? We've all gotten enough invoices that we have an idea of what an invoice should look like <laughs> if we're making that kind of report. But again, with something interactive like this, you've got this issue, you're starting with this blank canvas, and sometimes there's a little bit too much flexibility. So especially when you're talking about a small organization, consistency is really important because the goal is to get people to not only use the reporting, but to understand how to use it to reduce that learning curve that's going to be there and to hopefully get to the point that some of those users are able to create their own content. And there is a learning curve. Um, Power BI, in my experience, um, is, is uh, it's got, I don't want to say rough edges. I think they've done a great job over the past five or six years, um, smoothing out a lot of those rough edges. But it's still a lot of times not what people expect. Um, it's getting closer to alignment with the Microsoft Office products. They've been working on that actively and recently. But there's a lot of interactivity features that people just aren't used to. I think people a lot of times aren't used to using a web interface for their reporting. Or if they are, they're expecting kind of canned or pre-created reports that do a very specific thing. And then once you get into actual report development, the learning curve just gets massively larger in my experience because what you're talking about now is probably three different programming languages plus report design in order to make a report. You need some way to access the data, so they might need to use SQL, they might not. You've got M for the um, data cleansing, and you know they might be able to use the graphical user interface all by itself, but if they have to touch M at all, that's a language. And then DAX is just a big challenge. It, there's a hurdle there. 
And so you're going to want to expect a learning curve. You're going to want to expect that you need to do a certain amount of training no matter what. Now, what I found in my experience is you in in a period of an hour or two, you can get people to the point where they can do basic report consumption and they understand the gist of it, right? And so there's a good chance that you can cover a lot of your potential users, especially if it's a small organization with a, you know a couple webinars or something like that. But there's going to be a learning curve. Um, you, you're not going to be able to just send people a link, but like, here's the report, right? In my experience. Or if you do, they'll be able to see, oh, that's a pie chart. That's a bar chart. But they're going to miss out on a lot of the functionality unless you're willing to walk them through it a little bit. And then finally, you have to make sure that you're delivering clear value. And this is where a lot of BI projects fall down especially something where you're expecting them through self-service to make some of their own value. And so it's really easy, especially if you don't have a good training plan, to miss out on some of those linkages and to just kind of not deliver the kind of value that's apparent to the users and will help them become advocates for Power BI and help them become report creators and all these sorts of things. So those are the four things I kind of want to talk about today. So. To talk about the type of users that we're dealing with, first, we need to understand a little bit, where are the roots for Power BI? So Power BI uh, originally was born in Excel. It was a set of Excel add-ins that were all created independently of each other. So there were some integrations, but they were designed to be able to work by themselves. And they were kind of separate. There wasn't a coherent vision, I don't think. So you had Power Query, which we still have today, for transforming data. And when it first came out, I struggled a lot with understanding the benefit of it. Um, Because I would see these marketing demos by Microsoft and be like, well, here, you can take this zip code data from this public API and join it to a table you have in, in Excel. And I, I didn't understand the purpose of it. Um, and it's, it's a really powerful tool. Um, it is, in my opinion, the most powerful data cleansing tool for business users that I've ever seen because it supports a lot of graphical user interface kind of pieces and that kind of stuff. It's just, it, you can do a lot in a way that is fairly intuitive. Um, then you have Power Pivot. Power Pivot still exists in Excel. It kind of lags behind, but the whole idea is that you have this DAX engine. And with the whole DAX engine kind of piece, you can get really, really good performance. You can get, I'm going to call it semi intuitive data modeling. Um, it, it's approachable in certain ways compared to. You know, the data warehouse paradigm of two decades ago that would take a whole year to plan out and that kind of stuff. But learning how to use DAX, understanding the mental models there are are very difficult. You had Power View, which was built on Silverlight, which is extremely dead um, for the visualization piece. And then you had Power Map, which was kind of this redheaded stepchild kind of situation. And so you had all these pieces. And at a certain point, Microsoft said, well, why don't we combine this into a single product that isn't tied to the release cycle for Excel and is supported on the cloud and all that kind of stuff. And so why do I bring this up? So two reasons to help you understand who the target audience is with this tooling. So first, Microsoft designed Power BI for business users first. Um, And it does that really, really well, but you're going to have to help them along the way with the journey, right? I think sometimes we take for granted that a lot of these Microsoft Office tools have been around for literally decades. <laughs> and so a lot of people have made have crossed that learning curve. A lot of people, I mean, we got I got taught it in high school how to use Excel, how to use Word. No one, well, I assume, if you find an example, let me know. I'd love to include it in some slides. No one is teaching in high school, here's how to use Power BI, right? It's certainly something that I've not seen. But the goal is to have a tool that's approachable for business users. And in general, I found that to be the case. I found that Power BI is able to meet people where they're at. But again, to help people grow, to help grow adoption, you're going to have to provide a little bit of support. 
And as part of that, Microsoft designed Power BI for self-service. So the idea is that it's a tool that people can use to meet their own needs. Now, you can run into a tension here because when you're creating reports, you want to be certain that the logic is correct, that the way that we calculate sales, the way that we calculate revenue, all these sorts of things are correct. And you want to create a report that is visually appealing, that's easy to use. And so sometimes self-service can run against that, right? DAX can be hard to learn. Report design, I've worked with plenty of customers and you know, no, no criticism against them, but think that kind of more is better and we'll just put as many <laughs> visuals on, on a report page as possible. And oftentimes, you know, just it's not going to be the most efficient sort of thing. But the question is, what is self-service, right? Like, it's very clear here in uh, Pennsylvania what self-service gas is. You know, <laughs> I know how to pump gas. If I go over to New Jersey, someone else does it. Uh, I learned during the pandemic what a self-service haircut is. But what's self-service when it comes to business intelligence? Is it just viewing a report? If I send you a link in an email and you click the link, have you self-served <laughs> that report and you know eh, probably not no right um well what about applying filters you know at, at that point they're taking proactive action or is that something that is so basic or expected that you can't really say it's self-service business intelligence it's not like they're making a report they're just clicking on some some filters well, what about some of the more advanced interactions like cross filtering or drill throughs? Is that self-service? What about modeling data? What if you're making their own data model or, or enhancing one that you've created? Maybe they're taking a data set and they're adding measures. Or finally, what if they're creating their own reports? Clearly, that's some type of self-service business intelligence, right? And so the way that I think about it is that self-service BI is about creating business meaning without needing IT help. And so, you know, if we go back, you can see I have the colors kind of change because it's a gradient, it's a spectrum. And one of the things that's important when you're understanding your users is like, where are they on this spectrum? And we'll talk about some more in a second. And how can we support them? Um, because what's gonna, what you're gonna find is that the first and most important thing is making sure that people can do the basic stuff. <laughs> can they view the report and does it do something they care about? And then finding, given the time and resources you have, how can we support some of these other things kind of in a fading manner? You know, the more self-service, the less that we need to, to support it because the most important thing is, have we made reports that people actually want to use? Um, so when I talk about Power BI, uh, there's three different types of users in my mind, or at least the gradient, again, of that willingness to do self-service. Um, so the first one that I think about are report consumers. You know, this might be your executives. This might be someone in accounting who doesn't have any experience with business intelligence. Maybe they know Excel. And they just want the content. The content probably already exists in another format, just not as good, right? It might be data exports from some sort of ERP system or accounting system. It might be some old SSRS reports, what have you. And so it's really important to be able to make sure that these folks can get the content they need and that they can see that there's clear value. But then you have report explorers. And this type of user is where you're potentially going to get the most return on investment for switching to or using Power BI. Because Power BI is designed not just for consumption, but data exploration. It's designed for people to try and answer the question behind the question. You know, um, okay, I see that attendance for a class is down this week, or sales are down this week, or inventory, work, you know, inventory um, working capital is up. And so the question after they see that fact, that's a kind of declarative fact, is why? And, and generally, unless you're doing a lot of heavy lifting by trying to create some of these visuals that provide that narrative right away, you need to support that exploration, right? Allowing them to drill through to the next 
uh, to another page that has the detail for this particular week or to have a tooltip that hovers over and says, here's the different product category breakdowns and a little bit of the why. And so you're going to have the most added value if you can support these types of users. And one of the nice things is that there's different levels of that that Power BI supports, right? And so in my experience, it might only take 10% more effort for your initial project to really support these users well. And this tends to be when we do work, when we do consulting work, this is where we start to get some of that wow factor. The third type are report producers, right? These are people who are willing to create content either in an additive fashion where they kind of take your existing data set and maybe add some measures or they make their own report based off of the data set or just from scratch, right? They know enough about accessing the data to be able to create their own reports. And again, maybe they need a little bit of training to get there because it's a new tool. When people talk about Power BI, or sorry, when Microsoft or, or kind of marketing talks about Power BI, you would think that they want everybody to be report producers, right? Because there's this big push for self-service. And, and the reality is, at least in my experience, there may be a few people like that. Maybe you, maybe you're the person who's falling into your lap and you have to produce these reports or content, but it's going to be very rare. And so I think a lot of times what you should do is try to keep the content clean to support those kind of people, be willing to do some uh, training, but understand that most people are not going to fall into this third bucket. And so what do you need to do to support all these people? So report consumers to support them, you have to make reports <laughs> and you need to make sure that you're doing some of these best practices. And so we'll talk two weeks about some of the design best practices, but you need to make sure that you're making content that they want of you, that's going to meet their needs and is easy to understand. And so, um, you know, a lot of that sounds kind of straightforward, but it can take some work because they may not be doing any interaction with the reporting or, or very, very little. And so your key message needs to be immediately visible on your report pages, or you have to be willing to spend a certain amount of time going through these iterative cycles and asking them, okay, what are you doing with this old report? Or, okay, here's this information. What other things would first come to mind that you want to be able to see? Then you have these report explorers. So supporting these folks is interesting because it's all about kind of going to the next level in terms of report design. Right, So it's not just about displaying the data, showing the data, but it's about taking advantage of the interactivity that's available with Power BI. So usually a lot of times what that means is when you're modeling your data, you know, hopefully you're doing something like a star schema anyway, where you have your business event table or transaction table in the center and you have these dimensions. But one of the first things is when you're modeling your data, what dimensions can we add to give them the ability to slice and dice the data? And then how can we surface those filters, so they have access to it, how can we allow cross-filtering within the same report page? So if I notice that sales are up, if I have a table that lists the sales for specific product categories, for example, I can click on a row in that table and it filters everything else on the report. And so you know that report consumer is just viewing the report as it is, getting the high-level information, but the explorer can filter on different pieces, cross-filter, things like drill-throughs, can really help answer those questions behind the question or answer the next thought. Rich tooltips can, again, give this contextual, in-the-moment kind of information that adds a lot of value. And then finally, for report producers, um, there's really two things to support them. So first, you want to do as much upfront work as possible to have a clean um, data model that they can reuse. If you've done the work of naming things well, of organizing things well, of using display folders to group together your measures, all these sorts of things, then you can end up in a situation where the amount of effort to make a new report, maybe that has a specific need and isn't something you'd want to support normally, can be very, very low. Um, but the other piece is you're going to have to be willing to provide some training and some support. 
you know, these are the folks that you're either going to have to provide a really good data model that they're able to work off of, or you're going to have to start teaching them some M and some DAX, or maybe, you know, maybe both of those things. And so there's kind of a gradient here. Um, the initial effort to support these users is higher the more self-service you want to support, right? Because you're going to have to make this content anyway. So the report consumer is going to be happy no matter what. But you have to do extra effort to be able to add these filters and these dimensions and to make sure that the behind the scenes of your data model is clean and understandable to give training on more of these advanced concepts. And so initially, it's easier just to support the people that are just going to read the report. But over time, the effort for those people, given the value being created, is, is higher. Because once you get the report producers set up, they can meet a lot of their needs. They can meet the needs of other coworkers. But having to support a bunch of static kind of canned reports over time can be a nightmare. Because anytime someone wants a change, they have to come to you. And you probably have a bunch of other stuff going on, a bunch of other stuff that you're doing. So there's there's a trade-off here. But generally, in my experience, it's it's a it's a layered kind of process, right? The most visible value is the type of value that has the least effort. So that's the stuff for those consumers. And then as you're working the project, finding ways to be able to add in that flexibility and that self-service capability. At least that's how it tends to work for the projects we do. It's like we have a set of specs that we know we have to hit, but then we try to find ways to add in that wow factor or add the ability to answer questions that maybe weren't asked. Um, in addition to understanding your users, it's really, really important to aim for consistency wherever possible. Because again, at least in the assumed context of this presentation, you're dealing with a new tool and a new project and people don't have experience with these pieces. And so one of the big things is lean on the defaults. So um, I really like using apps for deployment and content um, distribution because it's clear that it's only for consumption. There's a, a spot in the user interface for where to access that. You can automatically deploy it to certain people, or you can have it so people can search for it. Um, and so it, it just has this clear messaging around it. Whereas if you're having people share stuff, it can be a little bit harder to say, okay, yeah, this is official and approved versus this is some kind of self-service sort of piece. I, I feel the same way about using the filter pane. So there was a, a Twitter poll and um, a blog post by uh, someone who goes by Grayskull Analytics, um, I want to say about a month or two ago, about should you use the filter pane? And, and opinions vary, right? Because it does require a little bit more learning than just having the filters on the page. Um, and at times it can be a little bit unintuitive, but it's built into the user interface and it's consistent. It's always there. And so I would rather teach folks something that's a little bit maybe subpar, but is consistent, then try to have the best kind of option, but in practice have five or six different ways that people are managing these filters and where the slicers go and all this kind of stuff, right? So wherever possible, try and take advantage of the default option for Power BI, because it's going to be easier to send people to documentation that Microsoft's already provided. It's going to be easier to train people in a consistent manner, and you're just going to have less questions. And whenever you're getting something like this off the ground, there's going to be a lot of questions. Additionally, I find it most efficient to organize the content by business function, both in terms of security, but also just helping people understand, okay, where do I go, right? And so you'll likely have one app for financials, one app for operations, one app for HR, what have you. You may end up having multiple, you may end up having to having to split it, but I get this question a lot, like, you know, how should we organize these reports? And and whatever you do, you want to pick a consistent pattern so people can intuit or guess where they should be going for their content. And then in addition to the defaults provided by Microsoft, start to think about what kind of patterns you want to help develop as these defaults. What defaults can you create? 
So the first one is think about report flow, right? If I can get folks used to a certain way of doing things for one or two reports, then they might come to expect that for other ones. So I, the way that I tend to do a lot of my report design personally is I try to have it so that the earlier pages are as high level as possible. And then as you go deeper to the right, you go deeper into the content, right? In addition to that, I try to do the same thing for the report design from top to bottom. I try to have the KPIs at the top, and then I'll have some detailed pieces on the bottom. And the whole idea is that people get used to a certain flow for how they're going through the report. Something else that you may want to consider is the use of background images to give kind of an overall guidance for how to lay out the report. I, I was involved with that on um, a project where, you know, had hired a, a graphic designer to create these templates, and they were really, really helpful both for the end customer, but for me, because <laughs> I had a spot where I was putting these kind of high-level KPIs. There's a, a blog post by Alluring BI where they show how you can do this without being a graphic designer with just PowerPoint. You can go into PowerPoint, set it to a certain uh, aspect ratio, put some text boxes, change the colors, add some drop shadows, and it looks really, really good. Now, I wouldn't do it at this level of detail where what you're doing is you're having a different one for each visual. But what I would consider is, okay, what are the specific kind of layout patterns? And so instead of having six boxes here, I might have two. I might have one for the top bar and one for the bottom detailed section, and then have some branding if you are the kind of person where it's important to have this internal branding and provide that as an image that can be used and have multiple of them for different kind of layouts so that when other people are creating their own reports, they have some guidelines to work off of and they're not just putting stuff everywhere, right? Um, if you can establish these types of design patterns early on, then it really reduces on the cognitive load of your users. And it makes your life easier too, potentially, because then you're not just staring at a blank screen, you have somewhere to start from. Um, next, you know, like I said, there's a learning curve with Power BI. A lot of it is unintuitive and you're going to need to assume that training is required for things that might be way simpler than you expect, right? And I think we just get blinded to that if if we're creating content then we're used to the tool <laughs> and i know back when i was learning about power bi um back in like 2016 it was rough um but also like we just get used to a certain amount of experience that people have with certain existing tools like microsoft office and so be prepared to explain okay how do we access the report how do we do basic interactivity right don't make any assumptions that the person's going to know, okay, how do I apply a filter? How do I do cross filters? How do I drill through? Assume that they have no expectation of that kind of functionality. Assume that they're expecting, they click a link, there's a report, it has all the information that they need and be willing to walk them through these things. Now, in my experience, it doesn't take a lot to communicate this kind of stuff, but don't assume that it's going to be intuitive. Um, and, and be willing to walk them through these kind of self-service options and the ways that they can take content and expand it. So like I said, you should hopefully only need to plan maybe a couple webinars to cover a lot of this basic kind of stuff. And then maybe some follow-up pieces for people who are kind of further along or want to be able to do more. But you can't just assume that people are going to pick it up on their own. Otherwise, uh, adoption of the tool is going to really going to suffer. And so coming back to these types of users, I think, I know when I was younger and I worked in business intelligence, I had this kind of expectation that um, I was going to take these folks who just wanted the content <laughs> and I was going to carry them all the way to be these advanced report producers. Um, I remember uh, way, way back, whenever I was both making reports, but also helping people with just random issues, they would have some desktop problem and I would fix it. And I'd want to tell them this MacGyver story of how they fixed it. And I'm like, do you, do you want to hear? And it's like, is it working? No, I'm good, right? And so instead, what I, what I think makes more sense 
is meet people where they're at and try to scooch them up a little bit, right? Try to get it so the people that are used to just having these canned reports are able to kind of make apply some basic filters. Um, show the people who are already comfortable exploring some of the more advanced kind of capabilities or give them a little idea of how they can not only dig around, but if you're comfortable with it, export some of that data into Excel or make a report that points to the same data model and how they can start answering some of their own questions, right? So try and just meet people where that and bring them a little bit forward and be prepared that there's going to be different people along this spectrum, like I said. Um, then kind of finally, deliver clear value. Um, and that sounds obvious, right? Like <laughs> if, if someone wants to buy uh, a sandwich and you give them a pizza, they're going to be upset, obviously. But the reason I make this distinction is a lot of the value added by Power BI is not visible or is not easily visible. And this is a slide from the, the presentation from two weeks ago. Um, first, you have a lot of value that's hidden. So work that you might do to help your future self, which you should help because they're a cool uh, you know, person, uh, is going to be completely invisible user. They're never going to see it. Or potentially, you might be hiding report pages and columns and things that they don't want to see. And so it's intentionally invisible. Um, but there's things that you're doing to make your life easier and make these report producers' lives easier. No one's ever going to see. Then there's going to be stuff that they expect um, that's kind of table stakes that is visible. Um, and so this is going to be how aesthetically pleasing is the report? How easy is it to read? Does it have the information that they asked for? And it is in a way that's understandable. And so this is the part that's most visible. And then finally, you're going to have this stuff that can be that wow factor. But then you have to figure out, well, how do I get them there so they can actually understand how to see it? right? Some of that stuff they might discover on their own with the tooltips, but a lot of times you're going to have to, you're going to have to do some of that basic teaching. So you have to create some of those potential wow moments, but then you're also going to have to, you know, teach them and kind of bring them along with you. So to, to summarize, your user base is going to be at different levels and you should design in such a way that's kind of contingency based that you're assuming they're at these different levels and you're not trying to pigeonhole anyone into a specific category and you're not throwing out a lot of the value or capability of Power BI because you're trying to meet some common denominator. Um, next, plan to help them grow, right? Um, for some folks, you know, you may just need to point them to some of the basic resources or be prepared to answer some Q&A kind of stuff, but for a lot of the basic users, I would really recommend a couple training sessions just to get them going, show them some of what can be done, but definitely show them a lot of basics and don't assume that they have the that experience with that. Third, the most important thing is keep it consistent. Anything you can do to make things more predictable and reduce the cognitive load is going to dramatically increase adoption. And so in your report design, in any recommendations you make to people who are creating reports, in templating, all this kind of stuff, keep it consistent. I would so much rather have a slightly, like I said, subpar experience that's consistent throughout the organization than have something that is spectacular, but then have four or five different ways of doing it show up. So this is probably the most important piece out of, out of all of this. And then finally, understand what your users care about, because a lot of times they're going to be very, very practical about, okay, I need to be able to see these pieces of information. But in reality, one, it's going to be this iterative process and what they think they want may not always be what they actually want. So you're going to have to adapt and be flexible. But then there's going to be a lot of unknown unknowns. There's going to be a lot of things that they would love, but they didn't, they didn't know that they wanted, right? Um, and so you're going to have to kind of help them on that discovery journey because unless they have experience with like Tableau or Click or certain other tools, Power BI is very, very different 
than what they're used to. And so they may not anticipate what it can do. SQL Data Partners.